Yeah. Hi, everybody. We are live. Uh, just so you know, we have a change of venue, right? Because we are actually in uh, a campsite. We have just start. We have just been on a three-day so far tour of door of of uh, the Upper Peninsula of in Michigan. Michigan, and this is Tally. Uh, but anyway, yes, so I'm here right. we are in our campsite for the night, and we are going live. So, in this episode, here we are. And we are going, we've been discussing Money and the Meaning of Life by Jacob Needleman. Both of us read it years and years and years ago. And we started talking about it. So we thought, hey, there's some stuff in here. Because as we're going through all of the all of the the world today, it seems, particularly here in the US, unemployment is higher than it's ever been. Concerns about the economy, concerns about money. All of those things are sort of for, first and foremost in a lot of people's minds. So what we wanted to do is we wanted to actually bring in um, the book that we uh, read so many years ago. So we've been rereading it and having great conversations. So we thought we'd let you in on some of those conversations. But to get you started, so we're, we titled this like really we're looking at the force of money. So when we look at the force of money, what we're looking at, you know, is when you're looking at the meaning of life, what's life all about? What do we got going on here? The fact is, is that we've got um, what what Jacob Needleman says right here is the problem of money dogs our steps through the whole of our lives, exerting a pressure that in its way is as powerful and insistent as any other problem of human existence. And it haunts the spiritual search as well. So um, so what we wanted to do is really take a look at money, supply, abundance, and those concepts and really take a look specifically. Because if you look around us, um, it looks like money rules the day. If you got enough of it, you can get out of prison. If you got enough of it, you'll never get convicted. If you got enough of it, you know, you can influence elections. If you've got enough of it, you can. And there's this whole have and have not. Um, kind of reality. And so let's take a look at that. Now, for those of you that are on by Facebook or YouTube, you can enter comments. We'll get those comments. So any questions, anything that you want, just jump into the conversation. We'll see them come up and we'll address them uh, when they do. Okay. And there will be a lag. So hopefully we're good. All right. All right. So, um, so money. So he goes on to say, so I'm still framing this up, but he goes on to say that Money now plays an unprecedentedly powerful role in our in our inner and outer lives. And any serious search for self-knowledge and self-development requires that we study the meaning that money actually has for us. So the fact, I'll go on and just keep framing this, and then mom can hardly wait to just weigh in, I know. The fact that money enters into everything means that we have to look at every aspect of our lives from the point of view of money and the force it conducts in the life of present day civilization. Love and hatred, eating and sleeping, safety and danger, work and rest, marriage, children, fear, loneliness, friendship, knowledge and art, health, sickness and death. The money factor is a determining element in all of them. Sometimes plainly visible, sometimes blended into the whole fabric, right? Of like a weaver's dye. Think of our relationship to nature, to ideas, to pleasure, think of our sense of self-identity and self-respect. Think of all our impulses to help others or serve a larger cause. Think of all our psychological and biological needs. Think of where we go, how we travel, with whom we associate. Just think of what you were doing yesterday or what you will be doing tomorrow or in an hour. The money factor is there, wrapped around or lodged inside everything. Think of what you want or what you dream of for now or next year or the rest of your life. It will take money a certain definite amount. So frames it up. Well, I I I, I read it a little a little differently than you did, Kim. Oh yeah. But what I discovered was that Needleman was looking for the identifying factor in our everyday physical human living. And he considered all kinds of things, but he decided the thing that crossed all barriers and entered every little nook and cranny was the way we work with money. So that's why he used that to represent the influence of physical living while we're also aware 
that there's a spiritual life that we want to pay attention to, but it kind of eludes us because we don't see it or hear it or taste it or feel it or touch it. We, we do feel it, yes. Um, but he says we have, he, he considers that we have two, two, uh, a two-pronged life going on, one's physical and one's spiritual. And he says the space in between is where meaning occurs. Now that's kind of interesting. The space in between? The spiritual and the physical. Ah, okay. It's where meaning occurs. And so um, we have this conflict in human living of not wanting to appear greedy, but we do want to have the money to pay for things. And we don't want to appear overly influenced by money, but we don't want to get rid of it all either. So there's this push-pull going on all the time with regard to money in human living. So, so he uses that a money reference generally to talk about our physical living every day, day in, day out stuff. And then he says the awareness that there's something grander, something uh, more impactful, something uh, he calls it a higher purpose. And he says that is the, the spiritual connection that we all have that d goes largely unrecognized and unnoticed. We have, um, you know, we go to church, we have religious practices and those things, but that's not what he's talking about. He's talking about the, the, uh, that about which each one of us has. Um, I don't know how to describe that. Let me think here a minute. Uh, he said, intuitively, we know that there's a grander purpose. Intuitively, we know that there is a power beyond what we see evidenced every day. And he says, between that and human living is the meaning of our life. Yeah. So it's an it's an interesting book, and you will enjoy it from Kim's point of view too. But I'm I'm thinking about the teaching we have in metaphysical science, and it it, it what he's dealing with is our relationship to paradox. Paradox is our everyday physical living from A to Z. And what science says that is, is our own language of understanding the divine being that's present when we show up. So kind of a lot of words, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Play with it. <laughs> so, and so Jacob goes on to say, the point is that within ourselves, there exists the possibility and even the necessity of experiencing and serving something unimaginably great and inconceivably real. The structure of human nature is without sense or meaning unless the idea of this inner possibility is understood. And so he is kind of talking about that spiritual and then physical, like a duality that's present, whereas science really reconciles that to one being. That's right. It's only one thing going on, with, and your view of it is the only view you could have given what's there for you in your own self-discovering. Yeah, and, and, the, and the, the crux of the matter is that the puzzling part about it is that that which we think is real doesn't really exist. It's a point right. of view. Right. And that's a, that's a big step. Right. And there's a couple of things that you said, so we're going to put one of them up. In Mind as the Athlete, you said, a recognition of the nature of reality allows me to loosen my, an attachment I have to my current observable world. So let's relate that to whatever's going on. So say you've lost your job, um, along with however many million other Americans are now out of work. Um, and so there may be a whole bunch of attachment that you have with that job or with the money or whatever. Talk about that. Yeah. It a very good point to bring up because really the unemployment rate in this country is kind of startling. Um, and those of us who are looking for jobs, it's a, it's number one item on our mind all the time, isn't it? So what you really can free yourself a bit by thinking about or considering 
is that there is this divinity. You know, Shakespeare called it a divinity that shapes our ends. There is this divine being, whole, perfect, complete, satisfied, joyous, free, fulfilled. That's what's present. When the human thing called Betty shows up, so Mrs. Laird says in her in her statement about the human is human because it's divine and not human for the same reason. She goes on to explain, therefore, the human doesn't make the decisions. All the decisions in life are actually made by the divinity that's present. Mm -hmm. And you walk on not even knowing that it was there taking care of the situation. But if you understand that who you really are, the, the thing that gives meaning to all the stuff of your life, the thing that is consistent and drives the ship, if I could call it that, that being has the answer before you even call. So you wanna be a listening for your own divine being that knows exactly what you should do right now and right now and right now. Right. And begin identifying yourself with not desperately seeking a job, but prayerfully understanding that you're always fully employed being yourself. Right. And the answers are there. Yep. And when you can release your attachment to the way that it looks or the way you think it ought to look or whatever it is, that release shifts, boom, the view you have of your world. Yeah. It shifts your experience. The physical language that identifies that fact for you is language. And it shifts the minute you turn it loose. Yep. Yep. Okay. So what else you what else we want to cover? So he goes into a lot of really cool things. Um, in that just the introduction. You know, we're just talking about the force of money. Um, you know, the there's, a, there's a statement of, of Mary Baker Eddy's that, that really supports what we're talking about here right now. Mm -hmm. we, when a problem comes up, we forget about the, the being that we are. And we have the, the picture be real and vital and concerning and upsetting and all the rest of it. And Mrs. Eddy says, uh, on page 62, I think, in Science and Health, our false views of life hide eternal harmony and produce the ills of which we complain. So if a false view is producing the ills of which we complain, then it's a false view to believe that I could be without anything I need at any time. Mm -hmm. It's a false view to think that the look of Betty here is limited when the fact of Betty as being, being itself being, reflectively present in language, that fact is what rules the roost. Mm -hmm. That fact is the determining factor, she says, in any decision that's being made. So why can't I relax into that not relax from the standpoint of forget it all and just go my way. It isn't that kind of relax, but it's like no concern because there's somebody, some, the somebody would be me, of course, but there is something present called being, being me, calling itself Betty. And that something has all the power there is and all the resources there ever could be and knows the answer before I even ask the question. Mm -hmm. So that's what my listening is for. I listen for that guidance because even every human being I know has instincts, hunches. We know there's something more than you can see when you look in the mirror. We know there's a reality present. If I, if I can't put my finger on it, I still know it's present. I know that joy is present. I know that abundance is present. I know that perfection is fundamental to all living. And that all of that is present for each one. And really what we have, what I call them wake up calls, but what we have are demands 
to see that point in our own living. Mm -hmm. And when you can let go of your attachment, there's also a calm or a peacefulness right. that goes right along with it. That stress just seems to dissipate. Right. You know, it's like, you know, years ago, I know we had this conversation, but years ago when I lost one of my first jobs, I had $43 in my bank account, $43 in the bank. In a couple of weeks, rent was due. Things were going on and I had 43 bucks and no prospects. Um, and I had a conversation with mom. Uh, with Betty. And she said, you know, just get up every day. And just like you're going to work and you make sure you have one appointment every day, one interview every day. So I would get up in the morning. So I just let go of it all. And I thought, all right, I'm going to do this. So every morning I got up, got dressed and we're talking, this was back early in my career. This is when you, we wore suits and ties, you know, that, you know, skirts and pumps and the whole thing. Um, <laughs> now it's jeans, but back in the day, so anyway, so I would get dressed and I would go to Denny's and I would get a newspaper and I would look in the classifieds. Yes, it was that long ago. And I would look in the classifieds and I would just and I would circle certain things that looked like I was a fit for them. And then I would make sure I would call them. I would go home, get on my phone and I would call them all. I would find out if I could get an appointment and then I would go there. Sometimes I would just show up and to see if I could talk to somebody because I had a commitment that I would have an interview every day. So finally I got to this one place and I did this interview and I didn't have enough experience and stuff. And so I got home, went to my mailbox and there was my car payment, my bill for whatever it was at the time. And I, I thought I've got less than $43 now because I've had a few days of cups of coffee. Um, and, uh, and I knew my rent was coming due and I just thought, Oh, so I went up to my apartment and I thought, well, I don't know what to do, but I'm just going to take a nap. So I just laid down, took a nap. And sure enough, I got woken up about 45 minutes later with a phone call. And it was the last interview I had been on where they didn't think I had enough experience. And the guy said, we've decided that we'd like to give you a shot. Can you be here at one o'clock? It was like 1130. I was like, absolutely no problem. And then he said, and I know you're looking for a full, more full-time job and what have you. So we'll make time for you to go to the interviews and all of that, but we'll have work for you. And I was like, awesome. So that's what I did. And sure enough, that week on Friday, he cut me a check on Friday because he said, I figured you might, um, that this might be helpful for you. And I didn't ask for it, nothing, but that was just showing up. So, and that has happened more times than not, you know, being an entrepreneur, having my own business, ha, it's a constant cash flow thing. And as I let it go and let things be, it shows up, business shows up, things show up, revenue is there um, and that sort of thing. So I just wanted to relay that because it's like just letting go of my own struggle seems to free things up quite a bit. Right. Yep. All right. So. What else? Where else are we going with this? Um, so he goes in here. There's some some really good things, but he says in here, uh, Jacob Needleman says that there is a. Um, let's see. Um, it says, "What is seen is myself as I usually am, with all my weaknesses, deceptions, failings, and sometimes happens." as sometimes happens when one sees oneself performing an action contrary to one's deepest moral values, or when one suddenly confronts oneself in the grip of some self-destructive habit, such moments of seeing oneself can result in the complete change of one's life. Freedom from an addiction, for example, dramatic change of this kind, however, tend to blur the most significant fact about these glimpses, namely that they reveal the existence within ourselves of a, what he's calling a second consciousness that is there all the time, but with which we are almost never in contact. And I put a note right there, basically the question, well, how do you increase the frequency, right? How do you increase the frequency of your real of knowing and being in touch with and having a sense of the divinity that you're all of the world you're walking through, that your being is bigger than this, but it's all. How do you increase that frequency? You increase it by acknowledging the facts that you know. Mm -hmm. it, it, this, this science, this reality of you is, um, 
equal to anything confronting each one. It's very individual. There's no such thing as not knowing enough. Where you are right now, knowing exactly what you know right now, if you can acknowledge that there is a power greater than the physical look of you, and that it's present, doesn't look too good right now from my point of view, but that divinity has no problem with any of it. And if I can just acknowledge, I know it's present, and by gum, it's going to tell me what to do, where to go, how to how to resolve the problem. Just just that simple acknowledgement takes you a long ways. It yeah. does not require anything more of you than you have present right now, because all of living is right now, and right now with whatever I have going on, I have that answer. Mm -hmm. And I had it yesterday and I'll have it tomorrow. It's always present. And what I have going on is always appropriate to exactly where I'm standing, confronting whatever I'm confronting, and on we go. So never feel that you're not ready. Never feel that you're not capable. Never feel that you don't know enough. Betty's never going to know enough. But the divinity that has Betty occur knows it all. Right. So the inquiry, so you're really, you're really speaking about an inquiry of, well, who am I? Yeah. And there, is there more to me than meets the eye? Yeah. Is there more to the world than meets the eye? Well, that's what scientific metaphysics does. Exactly. So it's an inquiry. So you, if, if you're in the inquiry of it, you want to look at, well, how do you increase that frequency? And, and it's through acknowledgement, acknowledging the facts, the facts of being all is infinite mind, infinitely manifest. So if, all yeah. is my own divine being yeah then there is nothing else and if i can just relax into that you know i have to tell you this cute story but i had a, a friend talking to me about that very thing oh many years back and said you know what if you don't really believe that there's something greater and i said well we don't really work too much with beliefs. It's like, suppose I didn't believe that two and two was four. Does that mean it's not four? Suppose I believe that two and two was seven. Does that make it so? So don't pay too much attention to your beliefs. They're just human stuff going on. But there is something divine that has you occur. And that you can count on. Yep. All right. So. so anyway, it's a fun book to read, but but read it with science for your vision. Really look for the ideas that have you whole and capable and see that the language that Jacob Needleman felt was a whole duality of life. That is not even an existent reality. The thing that I don't see is real. The stuff that I think is real is not even existent. So I want to really inquire about what's going on. Why does it look this way? I can tell you why, but you're going to have to find it out on your own. But the answer is this. You will know why. Because you are the one generating the world you're walking through. And you know the why all the time. You just don't consciously think about it that way. But it's the language that I understand. So I have it going on all the time, telling me what's going on, how I feel about it, and what's going to happen next, and why it happened yesterday, and so on. All that, I call it chatter. All that chatter. Well, that's maybe so, maybe not. And thank you for sharing a lot of it. Yeah which means don't pay attention. You don't have to buy into all of that chatter. Yep. Right. But it's that, it's that inner, I, mean, I would almost say it's like a meditative. Like, you know, when you, when you're meditating, when you, when you're at peace, you see things, you have insights. There's an intuition present, you know? Oh, well, you see that's what I'm saying. You're that's, talking about like transcendental meditation has a mantra. Well, yeah, you know, but, the purpose of the mantra. 
to get your mind off of all the other yeah, stuff. It, it interrupts the, the little thing in, in here that wants to chatter on about, oh dear, oh dear, oh dear, I don't have a job. What am I going to do? Where am I going to get the rent? How am I going to pay for food? It goes on and on and on. But the divinity that's present, see that perfection that's present that has you occur is right there. But you don't hear it because of the chatter. Well, transcendental meditation comes along and says, you clear it all out just for the mantra. The minute you notice that you're not paying attention to the mantra, you come back to it. So you, it's a sound. You know, I, I talked to, well, I took a, a course in transcendental meditation years ago, and they give you a sound that you repeat over and over and over. And then you find yourself getting, oh dear, but how am I going to pay the rent? And then you say, wait a minute, what's that sound? Uh, and you start doing that. And it interrupts that chatter that goes on that wants to really sidetrack you. So, yeah, right, the little chatter is not important. No, and that's the thing. It's when you're, when, but there is an intuition. There is a knowing that yeah. you spoke to that <laughs> is the right thing. And you just know it. You just know that that's what you need to do. That's what there is calling you forth. Um, and that's, that, in, at least in my experience, has really never led me astray. Yep. Right. And uh, the thing is, you're going to say to yourself, why am I going to do that? Well, you know, the why is because it's there to do. That's the only reason. I only do it because it comes up to do. I don't plan to do a lot of stuff, but I do things because it, it comes up and I say, oh, right. this is that God's wearing today. Well, all right, on we go. That's right. And in the book, uh, Jacob Needleman says, could our ordinary functions of thought feeling and instinct ever become so attuned to this higher presence that they actually submit to it voluntarily and joyfully. It's a really good inquiry to mm -hmm. be in for yeah. sure. And if, and then, um, so that's part of that, that inquiry you want to say, you know, you look at what keeps us, he asks another question, what keeps us as though drugged asleep to this possible inner spiritual life? Why aren't we terrified by our present conditions when we buy into the picture and language all around us? Yeah. Right? No job is terrifying. <laughs> why do we spend our precious psychic energy on craving? Why don't we? Why do we spend our precious psychic energy on craving something better in the physical world? What he calls, and he had this thing at the beginning about this prison that we're in, and we just crave better cells in the prison rather than seeking to escape the prison entirely. And that's what we're talking about. You know, what is this? You, you remind of me of that, that uh, sentence that Einstein said, you can't resolve the problem from within the problem. Yeah. So right. rearranging the furniture well, doesn't solve it. Right. But who you are isn't the same who that saw the problem in the first place when you resolve it. It's not in the same paradigm. Exactly. That's right. You know, so there you go. All right. So fun stuff in here. We're going to keep it. reading it. We'll bring you those conversations possibly next week as we continue on our journey here on our, our little have travel trip. Have we had trip. any questions? Um, there have been no questions that have come in so far. So if you have any comments, you want to make any comments, please do that. Um, I will let you know that, um, that we are, uh, this is all for the Institute of Metaphysical Science. That's at scientificmetaphysics.org. We are a nonprofit 501c3 charitable trust organization. Mention this. And um, we have, we have, so you can go to our site. You have all the programs that are there and available. We do accept donations. We're a donation funded organization as well. Um, as, the, as all of the materials and the teleconferences, we have a daily practice um, uh, study. study group called Bliss, the Bliss Conversations. They get together on regular weekly calls um, and they go quarter to quarter. So they, you can, uh, I don't think you can get in right now, but they start on quarterly timeframes. So you can get in and it's a daily, it's a yeah, regular daily practice so yeah. that you can do that. Um, and um, so anyways, there's all kinds of things. There's teleseminars and, and that, that will let you know. But I just want you to know that that is, um, that is the organization that sponsors all of these conversations um, and that we come to you and share all of this with you. So we appreciate all of your, um, all of your comments and your listening. 
Um, and uh, this was one comment just coming in. Thank you for this topic. Great info and wake up call, at least for me. Thank you so much, Diane. Really appreciate the comment. Okay. Well, I think that's all we've got for now. It seems as though the internet has been good to us tonight um, because here we are in this campsite and I've got my Wi-Fi little wireless device. So uh, we will see you next week and, um, and uh, on Wednesday at 5 p.m. Pacific time. We will have another live cast and who knows, we may continue exploring new things and new conversations that we have uh, looking at money and the meaning of life. So let us know. And if you have any questions or any subjects you would like us to really talk about and explore and dive into, just let us know and we'll take them up. All right. Until next time, over and out. Bye-bye.